Okay. <laughs> um, well, these, there, are gra uh, there are so many great questions that I wish I could take them all. Obviously, can't. There's one really good one for me that I'm not going to take. But anyway. <laughs> um, so I thought we'd start with the easy ones. Cindy asks to Richard Dawkins, what is the pattern on Richard Dawkins' tie? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Lala. Leaf insects. Uh, my wife, Lala Ward, paints all my ties. They're hand-painted on silk. And the only reason I wear ties at all is that, is that she paints them for me. Uh, I once wore a warthog tie when, oddly enough, the Queen invited me to lunch. <laughs> And she took a dim view. She said, why do you have such an ugly animal on your tie? <laughs> so I said, ma'am, because that's what you have to call her, ma'am, if it is an ugly animal, how much greater is the artistry to make it into such a beautiful tie? Aww. Oh. Beautiful. I knew it was a good question. Um, here's, uh, here's from Charles, age seven. Um, it's, for, it's for Craig, I guess, and it's a wonderful question from a seven-year-old. How can you turn genes on and off? So there you go. It's a very good question. Where is Charles? Anywhere? It's hard His to see from up here. Home. There we go. Yeah. There he is. There he is. All there right. he is right there. Seven-year-old Charles. But, well, there's lots of ways to do it depending on the system. There's, uh, there's switches that actually regulate uh, which genes are turned on and off. In bacterial cells, it's remarkably simple. Uh, and it's just uh, can be as little as uh, four letters of genetic code. Uh, but it gets quite complicated in terms of mixtures of different proteins that bind to the modulators that decide whether that DNA is going to be read and whether it's going to be translated into protein. So it's just part of the linear programming. Uh, it's no different than writing a computer code uh, for turning on uh, scripts downstream. Okay. So you'll be doing that soon, Charles. Um, <laughs> Haydn, who um, asks, um, I assume this is for Randy. It's an interesting question. If evolutionary medicine is so important, why has it not been researched or sought after before? And this is the reason, that was a good question, but this made me really want to answer it ask it. It says, please answer, I will get extra credit in my biology class. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you will get into medical school and succeed better as a result. So that's a very good question and I think historians will have a good crack at it. It's really preposterous that, actually get this Lawrence, do you know that all medical students have to learn quantum physics and matrix algebra, but they don't have to learn evolutionary biology? Wow. You, you might think that's a good idea. I, I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> um, part of it is that we live in a country that is substantially behind scientifically many other countries. We do not have Darwin on our 10-pound note uh, like he has in the UK. Uh, there are many people who oppose, and we just did a survey of medical student deans, and 45% of them said that it would be controversial to put evolution into the curriculum, and 20% said it would be so controversial it would interfere with their ability to run their medical school. Um, and, sorry, th this is the country... Don't kill the messenger. This, this is where we are now. On the other hand, we're educating all kinds of young people in courses on evolution and medicine at the undergraduate level, and they will grow up to be deans. This will be fixed, uh, but it's going to take some time. Okay. Yep, uh, Lawrence. <laughs> yeah? D Darwin's been taken off the 10-pound note superseded by Jane Austen. Oh, really? <laughs> well, I didn't know that. Oh, okay, interesting. A very great novelist. Okay, I, I can't believe I'm asking another question from Jacob, I think, but, but I am. Um, <laughs> and he's going to yell in the back again, I know. But, um, and it's interesting because it's not for Dr. Benner, it's for Eric, but I think I, I wouldn't mind a, a, a few people taking a crack at this one. We don't have much time, but anyway, Dr. Venter compared his work to building a 767 while not understanding how 20% of the parts work. What role does ignorance play in your work? Do we need to be worried? <laughs> Let me just say that um, a, a revolution in artificial intelligence happened in the 1980s when people realized that, that we needed to build bounded rational systems that 
knew they were very small, closed systems in an open world and could process uncertainty as a key currency. Ignorance is central in intelligence. Excellent. Anyone else want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. Let, let me add to that. Ignorance is actually very key for making scientific breakthroughs yep. as well. Uh, it's the ones that think they know it all and have all the answers that actually never do the experiment in the first place. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you have ignorance and you have just questions, you're much more likely to do the experiment to lead to a breakthrough uh, than if you think you learned it all in college. Well, moreover, ignorance guides, ignorance is what motivates us. Because the point of science is to ask questions when you don't know the answer, not to have the answers before you ask the questions, which is religion. Let me, let me, um, just, let me, just, uh, let me just build on okay. things. Okay. So, <laughs> anyway, I had to throw that in because Richard's here. So I'll say, one, I'll say one last thing about this concept. So um, when systems can manage their uncertainty and actually have uncertainty, they actually, we, we can do computations that are called expected value of information. All the systems I build these days, most of them do this. They're always computing. What should I ask next? Where should I look next? And that's based on the, the coherent processing of uncertainty. It's also just worth saying that you learn more from mistakes. When everything goes right, you think you understood what happened, and frequently you don't. But if you make a mistake, then you have to figure out what went wrong, and that's how you learn. And, and you know, we were talking today, I, I uh, created a program once when I was chair of a physics department in, on physics entrepreneurship, which the dean of our business school called an oxymoron, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> but in fact, he was completely wrong because scientists are very entrepreneurial. But one thing we don't teach, which is vital, it, we make the mistake of telling kids at all stages that we give them problems that are solvable, from test problems to PhD problems. But in the real world, they're not solvable. And in fact, for entrepreneurs, learning how to fail effectively is something that's incredibly important. And, and uh, one of the things we learned from business people coming back, they said they didn't learn in school, was how to fail effectively. And, and in, in, in some sense, successful scientists do that because you learn what research, pro you may ask a research question here, but you end up going over there because this one is a dead end. And it's really important to, it's the way it's done. Okay. Look at my early report cards. I was very good at failing in school. <laughs> <laughs> and you are a very effective entrepreneur. Um, Okay, this is another question that's kind of, I think, topical, and, and uh, you, you, I think Randy can answer it, but maybe the other people can, and maybe Richard or others too. What would you say to anti-vaccine communities? Is there any way to explain evolutionary medicine to these types of people? Well, so the anti-vaccine community needs to be understood in terms of social psychology, uh, which is a science. And you can see how people get an idea in their mind and all subsequent evidence that comes in, they lock it into what they already believe. And there's really no arguing with them, although you should try. Uh, uh, Richard, have you, have you tried it? Do you get any, any, any questions about vaccines from in, in the context of any? No, I tend not to get that particular question, but, but um, I empathize with what Randy just said. Anyone else have any experience, any of the biologists? Yeah. You know, if it was true evolution, they would eventually have themselves go extinct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. But, but the problem is they're not just a danger to themselves, they're a danger to the entire community by reintroducing diseases that we once got rid of. And now the general population is no longer immune to those diseases. So. Anybody in public school should have vaccines mandated uh, because it's not just a personal choice when you live in modern society. And it, it's worse than that because the, uh, the mathematics of epidemiology shows you have to have a critical mass and it's a rather sudden change yeah. once you get above critical mass. And it's it's, it's a, okay. Yeah. So Lawrence, it, it also having, inhibits discussion run, about... Huh? Having run one of the largest vaccine companies in the world and having bombs put under my car because of the use of fetal tissue, uh, associated with vaccine uh, production, but to this point, we're now seeing a resurgence in the UK, in the US, measles in California. We've got parts of the United States where polio vaccination has dropped to 70%. And the tragedy, most remarkable statistic of all, is that 40% of the current medical schools class at Stanford said they wouldn't vaccinate their children 
because of concerns about vaccines, which is, I mean, that's, not, that's intellectual nihilism of the highest order. Wow. Okay, I think we'll move on if we can, because I want to I try and get done quickly, relatively quickly. Two more questions. And this one's basically for Esther, and it's an interesting uh, question. Have the five communities been selected? Where are they? And, and, and what's the population of each study community? I think they're hoping that they yeah. can be one of them. Um, yeah. There's still a chance, folks. The communities are going to start applying on Thursday. We're looking for communities of under 100,000 that are somewhat remote. They're not a suburb of somewhere else, so that you have both people are in the environment and can't go elsewhere for a dirty lunch. Uh, <laughs> and also, we want, we want the, the cohort to stay pretty steady, so we're looking for places that are, are pretty stable. We want them from all over the U.S. It's, it's like choosing a board of directors. You don't want five of the best people in the world. You want five people who are different and complementary. And so we're hoping we're going to learn a lot within each community and by the communities learning with one another. And you can go to hiccup.co on Thursday to find out more. Okay, good. Okay, last question is asked by another Origins regular, a young man named Schuller, who usually asks me about the color of my shoes. But in this case, he's, yeah, there you are. I finally got you one. Um, and I think it's an appropriate question to ask. A lot of people may think of it, and we're thinking about the future and in general. I don't know if there's a good answer. But um, is technology more likely to be used for good or evil? And why? Anyone want to tackle that? You're so profound, you know. <laughs> well, the definition of technology is a tool, and we've seen uh, tools be used for all the purposes that we have. But maybe I can shift, shift the ground a little bit on this question to talk about what makes science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and now medicine, so STEM with two M's, which I love, so special. Um, we all have an ideology, which is an imaginary relationship to a real situation. And it's a necessary thing to have. If you didn't have one, the world would rush in and it would be like autism. So all of these systems are uh, ideologies, even, well, religion for sure, psychology, but especially science. It is an ideology. It's an imaginary relationship to the real situation but it's a particularly good one because of its modesty and its willingness to keep asking questions as a collective process to not make assumptions in advance, but to look at the, to ask a question, get answers. Based on the answers, ask a new question, and over the period of these last four centuries come up with a, an incredibly detailed portrait of the natural world and also do an immense amount of good for human beings. So. Um, you know, this is amazing that this many people have come out for an evening of talking about science. Um, it's, it's just a great thing. And so I, I would like to thank all of you for coming, thank the incredible scientists that Lawrence has gathered here. It's, it's, uh, I mean, I'm an English major, and all I can say is, wow, amazing. Well, let me, um, let me follow that up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to go on a little bit there. Um, I'll give myself the last word in an act of generosity. Um, the, uh, I think the answer is obvious that the technology, uh, our lives are better. Uh, we live today healthier, happier on the whole lives than anyone in, you, in history, and it's because of the technologies we've developed in part that, that affect us. And so uh, I think it's a, it's a no-brainer that the, that the results on the whole of the scientific enterprise applied to technology have improved our lives. But to make that happen, we have to prepare our minds, and that's what this is all about. Fortune favors the prepared mind. And the purpose of having events like this for the public is to take the frontiers of science and, and provide you the tools which will be necessary for you to assess the technologies, the, the systems, the people you're voting for. And that's one of the reasons we do this. And I have to say, I have an I have incredible amount of thanks to do. I have been incredibly fortunate to be a kid in a candy store since I came here a little over five years ago. Uh, I have been humbled tremendously by the fact that the people I've invited to be part of our programs have agreed to come. It's made me feel uh, incredibly special that they have taken time out of their very busy lives to come here 
and spend time in our scientific workshops. And one of the reasons, of course, is the carrot. They get to be with the best people in the world. And our scientific workshops have been amazing. And then they share that with you. And then I have to thank you. As, as Kim just said, there is nowhere else in the world that I know of where 3,000 people will continue to come to events for science. And as long as you keep coming, we'll keep putting them on. So the best is yet to come. Thank you very much.